They promised me a free meal if I would preach tonight. I may be a happy stand up again just for a second. This saved 10 minutes of preaching doing this. We have the victory in Christ, don't we? How many of you are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God? Uh, and I want you to look at your neighbor right now and say this to them. Say, you must be a genius. And, and say, because you decided to sit next to me, you must be a genius. And then tell them the glory of God's going to fall right here where I'm standing. So you must be a genius because you're in the glory zone. How many of you believe that about yourself? Do you? You know, uh, you may be seated now. I'm going to have you smile at me. I preached for 10 years at Berkeley to a bunch of grumpy university students. And after that decade of seeing all those miracles, I said, I'm only going to talk to people that smile at me. What I want you to do now is understand we live in a moment of extremes. Somebody said amen. And look at me. We live in a moment of extremes. In Isaiah, it said that gross darkness would cover the people. A few days ago, some things that were important became unimportant. And some things that weren't that important became very important. The atrocities that were committed on the Jewish people are indescribable. And today we're not Republican, we're not Democrat, we're not any category. There's only one category that matters, good and evil. How many of you believe we've seen the face of evil? And that evil is not just in uh, Islamic terrorists. That evil is in many of the urban areas of America. And since I've seen you last, some of you have become aware of the hand of God that came on our ministry. And suddenly we experienced an acceleration of promotion and expansion that was unprecedented. And that takes me to the next thing. I married the right woman. And she's a woman of God. I'd like her to stand right now and I'd like you to greet my wife, who's also a friend of this house and family. And that's Michelle. And uh, I don't question her judgments because she married me. So that always kind of overwhelms everything else. The tent crusades that we've been conducting in some of the most at-risk areas of America have been on the news. They've been in front of the eyes of millions of people. And I brought something because I look forward to what is my family to see this. The first video is 30 seconds long, and it's a kind of an overview of what has happened in our tent. Every 18 months, we've had to buy a new tent. And the next tent was twice the size of the previous tent. The first tent was 8,000 square feet. Second tent was 20,000 square feet. The third tent, we weren't even sure how we would get it. And somehow, Kenneth Copeland just finds out things. And so one day I was on the, uh, my phone rang, and it was a number I didn't recognize. And when I answered it, and it said, Mario, this is Kenneth. And I just kind of stood at attention. And he said, the Holy Spirit showed me that you need a new tent. And I had my thumb on the bid for the new tent. And that bid was for a 40,000 square foot tent that would seat 5,211 people. And that terrified me. 
So I'm sitting there with my thumb on the bill for the tent. And he said, how much is that tent? I said, it's $86,000. And he said, well, I'm going to send you $100,000 to buy the tent and some chairs. Can you give God the glory? Now, I hung up the phone and moved my thumb and saw the real price was $186,000. There was a one there that I didn't realize. So we did a meeting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Brother Copeland wanted to come, and he came. We give God the glory. And he said in, in a second phone call, I want to see you privately. So we met in the Maybe Center, and I was in the, one of the dressing rooms, and Brother Copeland walked in with his assistant, and he looked at me and he said, that tent was not $86,000. It was 186000 And so I'm going to give you a second $100,000 right now. So we had our new tent. And we put it up in the city of Colorado Springs, and we brought in volunteers from all over the nation. And there's gang activity and there's drug addiction in that city. And the first video you'll see is only 30 seconds long, and it is the first time that we used our new tent, and it'll show you what happened. We'll just play it right now. This is over 1,000 people who came forward to be born again in the front of that tent. I, I think this is Catherine Mullins who is leading worship, and that will show you that we completely filled it the first time that we used it. And let's give God the glory for that. that that's amazing. Now... The second video is at the Los Angeles County Fairgrounds. Now, Los Angeles is a communist city. Let's just face it. It's not even leftist or my, it's communist. And the mayor, the governor of California, is so open-minded, his brains have fallen out. And he has made it very difficult on Christians in California. And by a miracle, we obtained the Los Angeles County Fairgrounds for a tent crusade. And so we went into Los Angeles where the turf wars between the churches are as bad as the bloods of the crypts. And the Lord brought unity between groups that hadn't worked together in decades. And so the video you're going to see is Something very important, because in our meetings, the unsaved go to them. We don't do Christian events. We do events for lost souls. So we don't have a, a bunch of Christians coming to hear a Christian that they know or worship teams that they know. They've been met on the streets. They've been bussed in. They've been brought in. And so this is the Los Angeles County Fairgrounds when I ask drug addicts, gangsters, and unsaved people to come to Jesus. And this is a video of what happened when I did. From every section of the tent, they got up and started walking to the front. People bringing people. And uh, you'll notice a huge representation of young men that came forward. All ages, all races, all of them at the front praying. And when I pray with people to get saved, I tell them, you have to give up everything for Jesus. This is not you accept him as Savior and Lord later. You are born again, and you must give him all the glory. Somebody clap real loud. Thank the Lord for what he is doing. Amen. How many of you are blessed by that? So like I said... We live in a time of extremes, extreme darkness, extreme perversion, but God is moving. 
And he's moving in a mighty way. So I want to direct you to a verse on the screen. Proverbs 11, verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed. And I'm going to stop, look at you. How many of you believe the foundations are being destroyed? I don't mean of God's church. I don't mean of the Bible or the Holy Spirit. The institutions of man. The structures and institutions of America are being destroyed. The foundations are being torn up. An expert said this, why would there be such an emphasis on gender? And this expert said this, because if you can get a society to question gender, you can get them to question anything. If they don't know male from female or they believe there are multiple genders, they'll be, believe anything. So the object of what Satan is doing to America is to take all definitions and labels away. Because when people no longer believe in anything, they can believe in everything. And suddenly all matters of truth and right go out the window. The Bible says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Look at me a second. Why is that question not, what can the general public do? Why is that question not, what can the lukewarm Christian do? It asks one question, what can the righteous do? Because the safety of the last days is tied to being on fire for God. I'm going to look at you over here. I think you might even say amen. The safety, the promises of safety in the last days are tied to being on fire for God. And let me tell you, I have no good news for the lukewarm. I'm going to try that one again too. There is no good news for you. The only news that's good is that you're still alive and you can repent. Now, the next thing is, every verse of protection that pertains to the last days, in crisis or the last days, belongs to the remnant righteous. It's for them. It's, and here's an interesting verse. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. There is no perfect peace to the Christian whose mind is not stayed on God. For those of you that have felt odd, that have felt strange because you love God a little bit too much and your standard of living for God is higher than the rank and file Christians you see in the culture, it's because innately that is the move to safety. That is where it is. And I've been asked by the news media, what do you think the church in America should do with the situation in Israel? And it came to me, repent. The American church needs to repent. There's no safety without that, and there's no power without that. Now, you go into the end of that chapter, the 26th chapter of Isaiah, you go to verse 20 and it says, Come my people, enter in your chambers, shut the doors behind you, hide yourself as it were for a little mo moment until the indignation is past. For behold, the Lord, reading verse 21, comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no longer cover her slain. In an inadvertent way, this is telling us about the, this is a prophetic word about the coming of the news media. We now can see bloodshed. As soon as it happens anywhere in the world, it can be on a device that we hold in our hand. And so the earth is no longer able to hide the atrocities of Hamas, Hezbollah, or what we're watching from a myriad of different villains around the world. There is 
what China is doing to its own people that is indescribable. So we're living in a very dangerous and horrifying time. But one thing becomes clear. Your preaching as a pastor and a minister in this current atmosphere, if it's not repentance, if it's not get on fire for God, if it's not believe the Bible is the word of God, if it's not, let's trust in the truth of a holy life, you have no promise of safety. And the great disaster of the 21st century that will be remembered in theological history is that we created a generation of Christians that believed they could have God's favor and God's protection even when they were in rebellion. And that is not in the owner's manual. And I'm going to amen myself. Amen. I took you off the hook. Matthew 24 is a very mysterious and powerful chapter of the Word of God. Because in Matthew 24 is the most exhaustive and detailed manual on how to survive a moment like we're living in right now. There is a, an amazing amount of saturated truth in it, and I would need an hour, and I've only got a few minutes. So I'm going to look at you, and I'm going to tell you that if I were with you, and you and I were walking on the Capitol Mall, and over here to my right is the Lincoln Memorial, and over here to my left is the Washington Memorial. And in between is the vast number of Smithsonian buildings, the National Archives, the Halls of Congress, the Capitol Building, the White House. And I were to walk through that phase, and you would marvel and look at it and say, what an amazing place. And the Capitol Mall of Washington, D.C. is an amazing place. But if I'm standing there and I look at you and say, you see all these buildings? One day they will be torn down to the degree that one, not one brick will be left on top of another. What had I inadvertently predicted? The destruction of the United States. Because if you could destroy Washington, D.C., you've destroyed America. Can I get an amen? That's precisely what you need to understand, that Jerusalem under Herod was even more impressive than it was under Solomon. Oh yeah, he built the temple. And yes, silver was a common mineral on the streets of Jerusalem. But the buildings that Herod the Great built were far more impressive. And Jerusalem never looked bigger or better than it did under Herod. And Christ arrived when the Jewish empire architecturally had reached its zenith. And he looked at him and he said, and they were telling Jesus, look at all these buildings. Look at all this. And he said, I tell you that the day is coming when all of this will be destroyed to the point where there won't be one brick left on top of another. That was fulfilled dramatically surgically accurately in 70 AD, less than 30 years after Jesus said it. And the interesting thing was, is that Caesar had instructed Titus, the general of the Roman legions that were sent to Jerusalem, said, don't destroy the city. They, that literally, he said, put the people in order, the Jewish rebels, put them in order, but don't destroy the city. I like those buildings. But what happened was the moral degradation of the residents of Jerusalem was such that when Titus arrived, now let me add one more thing about this. Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, run to the hills. That's why in the massacre of 70 AD, it was mainly Christians that survived because they obeyed the prophetic word of Jesus. Now, Titus arrives, 
tells the people, come under Roman order, civil order. And they said no. And it wasn't a righteous rebellion. It wasn't the kind of thing that you would uh, say they were standing up for the Jewish faith. It was a riot. It was a mob reaction. They disdained the Romans. They insulted them until the point that they raised the rage of the Roman legion to a level that was uncontrollable. That they not only murdered, they think, nearly a million people, but they tore the city apart until there wasn't one brick left on top of another. That's how clearly that moment was. So when you hear Jesus say, you see these buildings? Not one will be left on top of another. He meant it to the nth degree. Now, why are you telling me this? I want you to listen very carefully. It said later on, privately, in Matthew 24, that they said, when he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Look at me. Matthew 24 wasn't written for the general public. It was written to the remnant righteous who in the last days would see the tumult of international extremes of weather, of warfare, of perversion, and said this is how the hand of God will be on the righteous. That's why when I get in my tent, I am never ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am never going to back down. I'm telling the drug addict, I'm telling the lost, I'm telling there. You don't believe in women's rights if you leave Jesus out of the narrative. You don't believe in racial justice if you don't bring Jesus into the center of the conversation. And holiness and righteousness are not only a subject that I'm proud of, that I'm telling you as the days go on, that this Midnight car dealer Christianity is going to go out the window. And in its place is going to come a remnant of people that say, I love Jesus just for Jesus. And glory to God. And his presence in my life takes away my fear. His presence in my house will cover my children. And Psalm 91 will be real to me as a remnant righteous person in Christ that a thousand will fall and 10,000 will fall, but it will not come nigh unto you. Now, Houston, you got to ask yourself a question. Do you want this McDonald's High carbohydrate, woke Christianity that works until Israel's invaded, that works until gangs and aliens take over? Or do you want the Christianity that puts your feet on a rock? I'm trying to preach here right now. Hallelujah. Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the earth. And Jesus answered and said to them, there was a question they should have asked. They didn't. So he didn't answer the question they asked. He answered the question they should have asked. What was the question they asked? They asked, when is this going to happen? so I can move my money out of the bank. They question, they should have asked, is what should I do when these things start happening? And that question goes all the way back to Psalm 11. If the foundations are removed, what can the righteous do? Not the general public, the righteous. Because that, my friend, is the issue. Now watch. Take heed that no one deceives you. 
What should I watch out for in the last days? Take heed that no one deceives you. Not move your money, buy a Grecian urn, fill it with soybeans, and buy a cabin in the mountains. But take heed that no one deceives you. And then he said, for you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not troubled. Number one, everybody say it after me. Do not be deceived. Say it. Number two, do not be troubled. I want everyone in this room to make up your mind right now that you are in a, a blood-bought child of God and your circumstances are in the hand of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, my determination to live right for God, my determination to not be the husband who lets the wife pray for the kids, my determination to be a man of honor, a man, am I preaching yet, by the way? To be a man who is a spiritual leader. I don't cheat on my wife. I don't mess with money. I don't develop partnerships with corrupt business people. No matter how Christian or how many fish symbols are on their pickup truck. There's one way of living, and I'm going to live that way. And I'm going to stay that way. And I'm going to stay that way. And it's not sexy. It's not fashionable. But brother, let me tell you, it's safe. <laughs> Hallelujah. And safety is going to become the premium pursuit of the world. Now, the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and are safe. There it goes again. He didn't say the general public runs in and they're safe. He doesn't say that the lukewarm believer is running in and is safe. It says the righteous. How did we ever invent an idea that it was okay to know God and not be righteous? Where did that come from? You know, they didn't just invent artificial intelligence. We've had it in our government for years. And that is a part of, inner, of it right there. Now, it says this. Don't be troubled. These things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, various places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Beware when the word warns against the rise of many false prophets. And it says, beware of false prophets, that you may find yourself in a time where the Bible says there will be, and that's what Jesus said in verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. The second time the word deception appears in this chapter. He says, begin by this. Do not be deceived. Facebook and YouTube arrived just in time for self-proclaimed prophets to rise up in the church and distract the church from being ready for what's coming on the earth, number one, and number two, to stop winning souls. How did we lose America? We quit winning souls. 25 years ago, a slew of pastors in our nation became enamored with psychology and counseling and positive thinking and motivational speeches to where the line became blurred between a preacher and a stand-up comedian. And in that, we wondered what that would generate. What would that create? Would that create a generation of Christians that could stand in the storm? No. Not only could they not stand in the storm, they wouldn't even know what it was. So now we arrived at the moment where we woke up one day and we had a non 
Christian nation because we didn't win the loss. And we didn't win the loss because the preaching we sat under made it about us and our personal enhancement and growth. Suddenly, we weren't carrying a cross. We were carrying debt, and we were carrying responsibility and lifestyle. And people became weighed down with what other people thought of them and how they appeared. Now, here we are in this moment. Is God going to save America? Is God going to spare America? How many of you would like to know my answer? Raise your hand. I'm going to take a vote right here. I have good news, and I have bad news. Let me give you the bad news first. Because God is going to save America, you need to understand what he's willing to do to save America. In order to save America, because we are a nation that was founded on a miracle, warts and all, you can bring up slavery all you want, but it was around the world and practiced by every nation in the world. We were founded by a miracle, established by a miracle. How many of you believe that? Not only were we established and brought to where we are by a miracle, God has made a covenant with the dirt, the land itself. When those first settlers arrived on Plymouth Rock, they said, we dedicate this land to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you a quick story. I digress from my digressions. I learned that from Dusty Kemp. That's where I learned it. And this one rabbit trail will lead to another, but I'll bring it right back in a moment. The king of Syria took over the region of Israel in the Old Testament that we know today as Samaria. And what he did is he took all of the natural citizens of that tribe and moved them out and moved illegal aliens in. And when he did, there was something strange that happened. Lions were not natural residents of Samaria. They came from somewhere, but the Bible says that lions began to eat the residents. All these lion attacks came and it became so obvious that even the king of Syria wasn't anywhere near Samaria, heard the report that all these residents were being destroyed. And he asked the question of one of his commanders, what's going on? Why are these lions eating the people? He said, because the land itself is rebelling against what you've done to it. The land is sacred. God didn't just promise Abraham children. He promised him a land. Now let me look over here and tell you reason number 1,000 why you don't mess with Israel. Am I preaching yet? Uh, I might steal some water from someone. <clears throat> Somebody just say amen. You know, it's still okay to feel insecure. Thank you. And so... He said, what do we do? He said, we better restore Jewish law and Jewish worship or this, this is not going to survive. I'm telling the Congress. I'm telling you. America, you better wake up. I'm telling you this. Christianity will survive without America, but America will not survive without Christianity. It's not going to happen. How many of you believe that our very breath is dependent on keeping the Bible in schools, keeping Christianity in our legal system? So social media oozes with self-proclaimed prophets. It's amazing to me how many apostles and prophets would vanish if Facebook went under. They'd all be gone. And what amazes me is so many of the most popular ones never saw anything coming. None of them predicted the pandemic. None of them saw the loss of the election. None of them even were right about the midterms. And not one this month 
said that Israel was going to be invaded. But they predicted a lot of things that don't matter. And Christians are following them. And if you speak against one of these prophets, you're accused of causing division. Look at me. Causing division. Causing division. And Jesus said, there'll be a lot of false prophets. Now, don't you think it's odd that you're living in a time when the earthquakes that Jesus said were coming? And they came. That the wars that he said would come are coming and they came. And you still don't believe the false prophets have come. And they have. And you can't be selective and say you can't speak against these prophets because you're causing division. You know what the Islamic terrorists do? They'll grab a child or a woman and they use them as a body shield to keep an Israeli soldier from shooting them. That's what people are doing with the word unity. They're using unity as a body shield to say, don't you dare use the Bible on me. Don't you dare mention those things about heaping false prophets to themselves because you're causing division, brother. And I'm going to admit it. I am causing division. I'm going to divide the devil from the people of God. I'm going to divide destruction from the people of God. And I'm going to tell you, this is an hour for the remnant to rise up and realize I don't need to live on a daily word from some prophet on the internet when I can open my Bible and read the word of God whenever I want. Listen. Someone said, why are you so adamant about this? Because I'm a soul winner. And they make us look stupid. People running around saying that cows drive tractors in heaven and there's mountains of jello. Why would heaven be based on 20th century phenomenon of roller coasters? The people that lived in the 1500s wouldn't know what a roller coaster was. Heaven is going to be so transcended from some two-bit amusement park, it's going to be a place of unspeakable glory. Help me, somebody. And I don't care about Elvis or or. Yes, Michael Jackson, or if uh, Chris, the, play, the guy who played Superman, is giving flying lessons in heaven. It's nonsense. Don't believe it. And someone asked me, well, how do you know that isn't true? And I answered him, because it's stupid. Now back to the anointing. What a great time to be alive. Put your hand over your heart. I'm going to be done in five minutes. How many of you give me five more minutes, would you? Okay, I got five, ten, fifteen, twenty. You didn't realize I was a liberal, did you? That's how they do it. The invasion of Israel is a turning point for the world. Without a massive moral awakening in America, the specter of World War III is very real. God knows that. And God is willing to do something very extreme to touch America's economy, America's stature, and America's happiness if the choice is our destruction. The good news is God is going to save us. The bad news is you better be realize what he's willing to do in order to save us. But the churches that have stayed true, the churches that have based their fellowship on the Bible, the ones that have said the reason you go to our church is so you can know God better and be strong in the Lord are going to flourish. All of the others that built on sinking sand, half-truths and wokeness, are going to be gone and wiped out virtually overnight. And you'll see it. People are looking at our tent crusade as one of those symptoms of the turning point because they can't explain 
that without big screen skinny jeans and fog machines, we are drawing thousands of people for no other reason. They're coming for no other reason than to get right with God. They're coming for no other reason than to be saved. That is where the general public is going to embarrass the church in the coming years. That's why those who are preaching the truth are going to be suddenly promoted. Because they're going to be where everyone wants to go. Now, what do we do then? What do the righteous do? First of all, thank God. Thank God, I'm looking at you. Thank God that you chose not to be a part of the lukewarm faith. I think you better thank God. I think you better thank God. Because you're going to see the fruit in your children. You're going to see the reward in your children. Some of you will say, other Christian parents let their kids and their daughters get away with stuff. And we don't. And you feel like they are mad and they're saying, look, you've made me into a freak and I'm not like all the other kids. And you felt like you were wrong. But in the final analysis, your child is the one that's coming back home. Your child is the one that will ultimately say, now I see what you were trying to tell me. The other thing is miracles, signs, and wonders. A lot of people believe that healing miracles come because you preach on healing. But if you look at Acts 4, 29, you'll discover something really amazing. Peter said, behold their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may preach your word. It does not say, grant to your servants boldness that we may preach on healing. He said, grant to your servants that we will preach your word boldly. And here's the boldness of the word of God. Marriage is between a man and a woman. So the NBC News asked me, what is your opinion of homosexuality. I looked at him and said, my opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. The word of God is the only thing that matters. The only thing that matters. Some, somebody say amen right here. And because of this power of the truth, Peter is saying, Give us the boldness to preach the truth. There are not 57 genders like Heinz Foods. There is no justification for compromising the standards of the Word of God for any cultural pressure. Never. Because if we'll preach the truth, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and the power of God will deliver the alcoholic in one step, not 12, and turn hopeless, suicidal people into jewels and treasures of God's power. And if God can do that, nothing else matters. Shout. I said shout. I said get on your feet and shout. Hallelujah. Come on, get up. Give him a praise offering and a shout in Jesus' name. How do you come up to a microphone after that? Mario asked us to put our hands over our heart few minutes ago. What are we about? 
knowing Jesus and making him known. What are we committed to? The fact that every single believer is a minister of the gospel. That means that Peter's prayer is our prayer. And I pray we have the boldness to pray it. Close your eyes. Father, grant us the boldness to preach your truth. To live your truth. God, we ask that you break our hearts for the lost that are perishing in darkness without hope in the world until the light shines and the word is spoken and they get a revelation of the love of God. That your loving kindness through us would lead them to repentance, transform them, and make them soul winners, just like us. Father, we take this responsibility seriously. We pray as Jesus prayed. We sanctify ourselves for their sake. But not only their sake, but for those who will hear because of them. This seed of the gospel is exponential. And we join in your plan. We co-labor with you now, Jesus, in your harvest. We purpose in our hearts to lift you up, Lord Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. And if you be lifted up, then you will draw all men unto you. Let it be done unto us now according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a second because I'm going to pray for you for a minute. Now, God, you heard the sincerity and you saw every heart that prayed that prayer by faith. I ask you to grant us grace to live, to be. By your favor, I thank you, God, that we will be shining lamps to the world, that they will see us and they will see people who are so rooted and grounded and so strong in our faith that we are at peace when the world is shaking because you and your kingdom are unshakable. Jesus, I thank you that you have heard us and that you are answering this prayer by seeding us with fire. By the power of the Holy Spirit now, we are being renewed and refreshed and we are being blown on by the wind of the Spirit that is kindling the fire of repentance, the fire of intimacy, of desire for righteousness that we would hunger and we would thirst. 
for righteousness to know you, Jesus, and to make you known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.